Uh, this is Nick Christopher from Mob Tales. Hope you guys are doing well. Um, thanks for your support in the past. Please like, share, and subscribe, most of all. Definitely appreciate that. And leave any comments on our shows. Uh, we definitely appreciate that. I like seeing that. Um, today, we have an uh, interesting guest, a uh, very uh, prolific writer, director, producer, uh, Richard Fakiri. Um, good friend. And uh, we'd like to welcome you to the show. Thank you for coming on, Rich. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's always a pleasure. Um, oh, now I see you. I didn't see you for a minute. Okay. <laughs> Got you now. Um, just to, I'm going to give people a little bit of a background on you, just so they know before we begin. Um, Rich has been in the uh, entertainment business for many, many, many years. Um, acting, directing, producing, uh, plays, um films forget it, he's done a lot of different things so uh with no further ado basically i just want to bring on rich i want to first ask him to give us a little bit of a background of when acting directing films everything when, when did this when did this um bug you know when did you get this bug and just begin to get involved in this business well I believe writers are born, so I think since birth, um, but the development really came when I started writing poetry, believe it or not, and then from poetry I went to plays, from plays, novels, and movies. Um, I would say my first big film was Vigilante, starring mm -hmm. Robert Forster, Fred Williamson, Willie Colon. Um, that got me a lot of work in Europe, uh, Paris, London, uh, Rome. They were hiring me because Vigilante did so well here in America. But before that, I was a published playwright. And um, uh, eventually then my novel, The Third Miracle, was uh, published by Simon & Schuster. And then Coppola bought the rights. I wrote the screenplay with uh, John Romano. And they cast Ed Harris. And Hesh on my mule stall, and Anishka Holland um, directed it. Um, those were like my two. And right now, I do have a movie that's streaming on Amazon with Walter Matthau and Carol Burnett and John Stamos called The Marriage Fool, which was a play, highest rated CBS TV movie ever. And I, I wrote the teleplay adaptation. And then all these years later, it pops up on Amazon, and now it's actually doing really well on Amazon. It's on nine platforms, actually. So um, that's some of my work. That's some of my work. Well, well, I've seen I've seen some of your work in in, in person. Um, with some uh, some of your plays. Um, you know, forgive me uh, the the titles. I don't remember for some reason, but I did see them, and they were very good. Um, there's one I did see with uh, Lou Martini Jr., who was a good friend of mine and a friend of yours. Um, it was a play which was pretty good. Uh, it was I can't remember. Here the... it goes. Don't worry, Gangster Apparel. But that that's that one I knew from a long time ago. Oh, which, okay. Which was great. Thanks. But another one that came to the city. Oh, um, did you see Zaguada? The... I'm sorry. Did you see Zaguada with Lou? Yes. That's it with Len Caru. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was um that oh I didn't know you were there. That's great. Yeah. We had I a went, packed I house. Went to, I went to I went to two of them. There was one in um I think that was the one you're talking about. Uh but there was one prior to that that I went to see and Lou was acting with another gentleman and it was about uh, I think Lou was a graveyard digger or something like that. Oh, geez. Yeah, I forgot. Yeah, you saw Last Day with Dan Laurier. Yes. And uh, yes. Mayan Wampuzik and Lou. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. Oh. I didn't know you saw that, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, they were great. I liked them both a lot. They were very interesting. Thanks. Especially the one with Dan Laurier. That was really good. Yeah. Uh, it was funny, but it was serious and funny at the same time. Um, it was easy to follow. Uh, to get the storyline, to find out what's, you know, what the, what's good. A lot of plays, sometimes, some people do get a little bit confused. Because um, the story is not, it's not like a movie, where it's a different way of, you follow it differently, if I'm yeah. correct. 
Um, now, just getting back to what you just showed me, Gangster Apparel. Um, now, like you and like me and Lou, you're pretty similar. Well, you grew up around, because the show is called Mob Tales, so I'm just bringing this up. Um, when you grew up, grew up around, you know, that type of world, pretty much. And I think Gangster Apparel kind of depicted that in, in a different way, obviously. So um, what I'm trying to find is get to is how did how did that influence um, go into getting Gangster Apparel done? Okay, so yeah, I was thinking about this. Um, you know, th there's two answers to this. Um, number one, um, my grandfather, my father's father, had a tailor shop on Spring Street. Uh, the Aqua Grill uh, was there for many, many years. And um, I think COVID, they closed. So if you go on the corner of Spring and Sixth Avenue, that's where he had a tailor shop in the 20s. And uh, the black hand would come to yeah. the tailor shop looking for a shakedown. And um, I say all this in a documentary I made, and that's the third thing I got to remember to say. But um, anyway, um, he the police precinct was right across the street. They were all Irish cops. So my grandfather went over to him and said, hey, you know, I can't do your uniforms for free anymore because these guys are shaking me down. <laughs> and the precinct okay. said... Don't worry about it. You're never going to see them again. And he never did. So that was like the first story I heard about the black hand. And as, as your, your listeners probably know, that was the beginning of the mafia in New York City. They were called the black hand first. Right. And uh, the second thing I want to say is I got a grant from the uh, Russo Brothers Film Forum. You know, the guys who make all the Marvel comic movies. They gave me a grant to make a documentary called Where Are We Now? The Italian American Today. And actually, I, I talk about this story on screen uh, in the film about my grandfather. And uh, the third thing was Gangster Apparel, uh, which was published in the 90s by Dramatic Publishing. I was at the actor's studio and uh, somebody wrote a play called Thugs and Paul Newman was moderating and he loved the play. And I was like, eh, you know, this guy who wrote Thugs doesn't know anything about gangsters, you know. So I I went to my friend's restaurant and I said, you know, what do these guys wear? What do they do? And, and then I did a lot of research and then I wrote uh, Gangster Pal uh, in the sense of, you know, um, I was really interested in Louie and Joey, two friends. You know, people are saying, well, gangsters can't be friends. Of course they can't. And but Louie and Joey are very different. Louie is a snappy dresser. Uh, he has a lot of ambitions. Joey is more a working class guy who really is happy being working class. But he likes Louie because Louie seems to be smart. And what happens is that Louie feels Joey is keeping them down in their career because he doesn't dress well enough. And eventually he does and they get a big job on a hit. And it winds up that they were ratted on. They were, they were actually seen, a wit eyewitness, and they go into, um, they get arrested. And then Louis convinces Joey because he can't do time. He, they go into witness protection in Yuma, Arizona, where they become cowboys. So it is a bit of a comedy, but well, also a look at the American male from gangster to uh, convict to cowboy and uh I, one of the best reviews were in australia when the play was done in melbourne and uh one of the critics there she really got the play uh it's been done a lot I'm, i actually found on youtube two 16 year old girls uh did it and i contacted one of them and said what made you want to do my play and she said i really identified with joey so i was thrilled that it was universal you know it's been done by Got Russian guys playing mobsters. Um, it's it's really interesting who has done the play over the years. It's a two hander. But it, it was also it was in London too, right? Oh, it was in London. Yes, the original world premiere. Thank you very much at the old Red Lion Theater. <clears throat> it was done there, and um, I sold the movie rights to Paramount, Mace Newfield, 
uh, my who just passed away a couple of years ago. He was my producer. He loved the play. Could never get it made into a movie. I got hired to write the screenplay and everything, but never got the film done. Um, so I still have it. Um, and the play gets done. Pandemic really hit theater pretty hard. So, um, you know, but right now it's published, which is really nice. Yeah, I actually have that book. It's great. <laughs> um, and you have worked with a lot of big actors, a lot of big names through the years. And you've become very friendly with a lot of them. Um, can you tell us some, because you told me a lot of interesting stories when we were hanging yeah. out. And really great stories. Um, out of all, I mean, you, like I said, you met a lot of different people um, in the entertainment business. Was there any um, one actor or actress that really impressed you or left an impression on you in some way? Well, yeah, probably several. Um, but like Danny Aiello was a great guy. Um, I knew Danny. It's funny. I went to see him in a Broadway play, Gemini. And he was standing out in the lobby before the play, thanking people for coming, which is unheard of. And um, we got to know each other a little bit. And then he came to see a play of mine, the classic. Uh, and Valerie Harper was with him there. And he came over to me and he said, I want you to write for my new TV series, Della Ventura. And, you know, he was, he changed my career. I was not a TV writer at that point. And he called CBS and he says, I want Viteri writing for me. And uh, I started like a couple of weeks later and I was writing for CBS, Della Ventura. So Danny was a great, generous guy. He really was. And um, he never, not sure we ever worked together other than the series. He never did a play of mine, but he came to all my productions. In fact, right before he passed away, he came to see my two-hander uh, Lady Macbeth and her lover, um, two actresses. He came to opening night. Um, let's see, who else? Uh, Ed Harris was really a pro, real pro working on the set. Um, he wouldn't ask, he wouldn't change a line. And, and if he did have a problem with the line, he would ask you if he could change it. Um, Carol Burnett was a kick. You know, I was on the set with her and Walter Matthau. Walter was, a, he called me up one day. Um, before I met him, uh, before we started shooting the marriage pool in Toronto, and he call, calls me up and he goes, this is Matt out. And I go, oh, okay. I wasn't sure what to say. He said, I want to change a word. I want to change hot dog to Frankfurter. I think that's what it was. I still can't remember if it was Frankfurter to hot dog, a hot dog to Frankfurter. <laughs> and then I said, all right. And he says, I'll fax you the changes. <laughs> and then he sent me a three three-page facts of the changes. Um, Carol was interesting because on the set, uh, Carol uh, said to me, um, after the first dinner we had, uh, the whole cast, John Stamos and everyone, we went upstairs to her suite uh, the next morning and she wanted to change the scene because she was from Oklahoma and she was playing a woman from Queens and she said, I can't, I can't do Queens. Could you make me from Oklahoma? And I said, absolutely, no problem. So I made those changes. And then when we were on the set shooting, she called me over and she said, Richard, could you give me a line or two here that I want to say to Walter? And I said, great. I asked the producer for a piece of paper and a pen. I wrote her the line. She said, we got along great. Uh, Walter was terrific to work with, you know, really hard working. And John Stamos and I would hang out and have dinner every night I was on the set after we shot. I used to tease him because he, you know, he was pencil thin, you know, and his dinner consisted of a piece of fish. That was it, just the fish. And he <laughs> ate nothing else. But um, yeah, so I, those are some of the people I worked with. Um, some of the people, you know, I got to know. I'll, I'll rummage around in my head if there's any other people. <laughs> Anne Hesh was really, really sweet. Um, I'm, it's a tragedy with terrible thing that happened to her. But I, I found her so uh, easygoing uh, on the set of The Third Miracle when I was working on that. Um, yeah, that's some of the people I know. So, you, so, so you've, been at, you've been at this, you know, uh, entertainment stuff with, you know, plays and films and such of that nature 
And you've been on it for how long now? How, like when oh, a you? very long time. In fact, uh, Dan Laurier and I were having dinner the other day, and we were rem remembering that we met in the Italian American Playwrights Forum in the seventies, probably the late mid to late seventies. Yeah, and I've worked with Dan a lot too, and Dan's great. Dan, Dan's a real pro, um, and he's incredibly generous. He's always helping people out, always. Um, you know, if he could help, I, in fact, two writers, new writers I know, um, wanted to have dinner with um, me. And they said one of their most favorite actors was Charles Durney. And I said, oh my God, Charles Durney? You got to have dinner with Dan Laurier because Dan <laughs> knew him not only well, but every time I have dinner with him, he tells me Charles Durning's story. So the four of us just had dinner a couple of weeks ago. And they were like, you know, awe inspired with all the people Dan knew, but but also listening to the stories about <laughs> about Charles Durning. Um, I, you know, I've met and and came across a lot of celebrities actually over the years, and uh, never had a bad experience with any. You know, I mean, you know, I know Tony Danza. In fact, here's a fun story. Um, the Italian American Columbus Day Feast, right? I was invited to be in a um, float going up Fifth Avenue, which I, I put in the top 10 of the most, uh, I don't know, fulfilling things for, for a New Yorker to go up Fifth Avenue and float is <laughs> kind of special. And my float partners were um, Tony Danza, Danny Aiello, and Gay Talese. So I got to tell you, it was really great to go up there. And I know Tony on and off for years. Um, he did a reading of Gangster Apparel, actually, in uh, L.A. with Nikki Totoro uh, a few years ago. And uh, so that, that you know, those two guys, are, I know Tony and Danny a long time. And, um, yeah, so I know quite a few people now that when I think about it and have met. Well, is Gangster, I mean, do you, does Gangster Apparel every now and then get, you know, put out, like, you know, performed? Uh, oh, yeah. It, it was once my most produced play. Um, in fact, you know how we met? We actually met when Mace Newfield got the rights and uh, brought it to Paramount. He had a dinner for me with Tony Danzer and Chaz Palminteri, uh to play Louie and Joey. This is quite a while ago, though. Unfortunately, it never happened. You know, it ne and the last person he went to to try to get him made was De Niro, and De Niro didn't want to do it. Um, not to act in it, but I think, and I could see why, because he's now doing a movie that's kind of similar, but not really, but another gangster movie. So, um, but uh, I needed two, now I'm looking for two young guys, you know, and I just had, actually, I just had dinner with a couple of young guys that were perfect for it. And um, one of them is in Gravesend, uh, Johnny, John Oliva, am, am I right? Yeah. Yeah, I know and, who is. yeah he just did a, um, he 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 bought the play and said, "Man, you know, I'd love to do this." Um, yeah, so you know, it gets done. It definitely gets done. I would love to have made it into a movie, and every once in a while, it does pop up that someone wants to do it. Right. Okay. Oh, Vinny Pastore is another great guy I worked with. In fact, um, Vinny did my uh, movie, The Kids Menu. Um, I wrote a ten-minute play called The Kids Menu. Menu. Yeah, yeah, and and Vinny played. Uh, the, the pizza owner who refuses to put a kid's menu out when a local uh, yuppie comes to his place, um, a hipster woman who wants to have him to have a kid menu because her kid's getting fat, eating pizza. And mm -hmm. um, he was great. Yeah, yeah. It'll all come to me, all my friends that I know that I work with. Uh, it's all good. Um, now with the, with the strike being over, and, you know, everybody's pretty much, I think, getting back to work and doing whatever they need to do. Um, where do you see that business? The thing with the, you know, with the strike now that it's over, where, are you, where, do, you, where do you see it going? And um, do you think the advent of AI and all that coming about that people are worried about, what is your take on that? Oh, that's an interesting question. I don't have a fear of AI actually right now. Um, 
though I wrote a 10 more minute play called No More Writers, um, which is a apocalyptic look into the future where creative thinking becomes uh, illegal and punishable. And um, it's not that different from a 1984 kind of world. And it's actually not too different from what we're in now. Because as you know, TV and film is very formula, very form. A lot of formulas go into it. Um, it's hot. It's why I look at a lot of old movies more because I find it more exciting, more interesting, more surprising. Um, plays, the the writing of the plays is not formula based, but the plays they're producing are now um, quite. Uh, you know, they all have an agenda for the theater to get grant money. But um, I'm not as worried about AI because I don't think people would know the difference anyway. Um, you know, we're not in a great place creatively and intellectually. But then again, this country never was. Um, however, when you look back, it's always looking back, it seems like the best work is there. Um, you know, it's watching football. Some I look at how players behave and I go god I remember when it was a lot different <laughs> now that's two things that means I'm getting older <laughs> you know, they did this study that older people forget that all things weren't perfect back then and uh secondly it wasn't that bad it's not that bad now so I don't want to fall into that trap but I'm not worried about AI you got to remember the contracts with the producers come up every three years so we just solved the problem for three years um, what's going to happen in three years? It's going to be really interesting. Very interesting, actually. Um, and we'll see. You know, being a lifetime member of the Writers Guild, I've seen it go through, and I've seen us go through. I was also elected to council, so I've seen us go through changes. Um, but I'm so glad that the membership stuck together, and now we're back putting everything together again, the actors also. But let's see, you know, streaming is really weird, and I'll give you an example. When The Marriage Fool with Walter Matthau and Cal Burnett ran on CBS back in 1998, my residuals were one, two, you know, five figures. In two weeks, for two weeks, for two showings, I got really good money, enough to like a small family could support itself on. And that was just for two royalty payments. The fact now that it's running on Amazon in nine platforms, my check for residuals was $175. <laughs> wow. What they're saying to us is, no, we're not going to let you know how many people saw it. I know when it was on CBS, 20 million people saw it the first time. 18 million people saw the rerun. So that was almost 40 million people that saw it. Now, it could be high numbers. I have no idea because Amazon won't release those numbers. So... That is why streaming, things are really going to change, man. Really, you know, it's going to be up to the young writers, the young creative. And I'm not that confident that they're learning the best writing in all these writing schools. You know, yeah. I teach screenwriting at Queens College. I love teaching screenwriting. I showed my students two films in the last month because I do two a year. The Hustler and The Heiress. With Olivia to have them. They love the hustler, which would never be made today. And they <laughs> love the heiress, which has been made and totally watered down. So um, and they love the films. They're kind of like shocked because I said these were movies were they made for adults, you know. And I was just watching Godfather 2, and I'm like watching the scene between Al Pacino and um God, I can't remember her name, woman who plays his wife, Diane Keaton. And I'm saying, that'll never be done today. That scene would never be done. Because, you know, in a way, Al's like an anti-hero. And yes, the Sopranos, Tony Soprano was an anti-hero. It was TV. But we are getting, once again, really concerned about what the people are going to see. And is it going to be okay for them? And it's really kind of silly, is what I think, you know. Oh, I agree with you. Yeah. But was just so... so in a sense of, do you think a lot of people are saying, people I've spoken to anyway in the entertainment business, believe with this whole streaming thing that's going on, you know, Paramount Plus, 
um, Hulu, Tubi, we can go on and on. Um, do you think that Hollywood is due for due to not want to work use so much the word collapse, but I think streaming is taking over Hollywood big time, and Hollywood's going to be hurting. I don't know how long they're going to last. Right. Uh, what, what do you think? I mean, what is your opinion on that? Well, I don't, I think some of the best stuff I see is made outside of America. Um, my favorite series in the last couple of years was My Brilliant Friend, made in Italy. Um, even with the subtitles, I could not watch it. And I'm waiting for the last episode. I've read all four novels by Elena Ferranti. Um, where is Hollywood going to go is, once again, up to younger creative people um, right now, the streaming people are not film producers. They're corporate guys uh, and women. And, you know, to make movies, the producers were creative people. They knew what directors needed. They knew what stars needed. They knew what writers needed. Uh, they fought them, but they knew what they needed. I don't know if that's happening anymore. I really don't. Um, because these people that work for studios and run studios come from universities, at least at least in the last 20 years. What's going to happen in the future? Who knows? But I got to say, you know, just scanning what's on TV, I find everything really boring. You know, I hate to be boring, but it's, I'm I not excited. About, I was watching Godfather 2 just now, so I could watch some really good acting and <laughs> some really good writing, you know, and some really good filmmaking. So, um, do, you think, do, you I, think, yeah. do you think the independent film market is, I think they're coming up pretty great. I think they're yeah. growing at this point. It's very possible, but where are they going to show their movies? You know, you got to get the movie seen. And, you know, I'm on a small screen now, right? I want to go to the movie theater to see movies on the big screen. Um, because my uh, my uh, girlfriend wanted to see Barbie, I went to see Barbie. And at least I got to see a movie on the big screen, you know? <laughs> and I get invited to all the WGA stuff. I just haven't been really excited to see anything because, you know, I get to go to the movie theater and movies for me are made for the big screen. So in the, are independent filmmakers going to make, continue to make movies? I hope so. And I hope I get to see them. You know, the whole point is I want to see them. You know, I'm an actor too. Um, I have a, a movie that I acted in. Uh, I play Gus, a guy who runs a tool and die factory. Try to find someone who knows what a tool and die factor is and mm -hmm. um you know one to 60 or 50 and it's having a world premiere in in um barcelona in march and i think i'm going um but it was really fun because i usually get cast as gangsters you know i'm running in some or detectives so i get to you you know play a working class guy who runs a business which was very cool and um i'm i'm in I'm in the Great American Heist on Fox Nation right now about the uh, LaFonza heist that was in Goodfellas, but actually my character um, was not Lou. Great, now I forgot my name. But my character uh, who created the whole thing was not in the movie, but I yeah, play him in this movie that's running called The Great American yeah, I Heist. I think his name was Louis Kaufman. What's I'm, that? I think his name was Louis Kaufman, I think. Or Lou, yeah, Louis uh, Werner. Happy. No, Lou Werner. That's it, Lou Werner. And, Lou, yes, some of us. yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah, he was the only guy that went to prison. Right, that's correct. Yeah. But it was his idea. <laughs> yes, it was my idea, my character's <laughs> yeah, idea. My character's idea. It was, yeah. it was Louis's idea and this other guy, Robert. It was two people. But right. then, you know, of course, you know, Henry Hill and all them came into the picture. Yes. Know? Um, but yeah, you're right. That's 100 percent correct. That's how it really went down. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, I was surprised when they gave me the script. I didn't know, and they offered me the role. And it's funny. I get offered roles because people are fans of Vigilante. <laughs> so, <laughs> and and then they see me on backstage and go, "Wow, you're acting real. You act." I go, "Yeah, I act. I definitely <laughs> do. I'm actually. Um, I mean, uh, I've been uh, Evan um, Dominguez's uh, new film." called the superintendent and what do i play a working class guy a superintendent but i'm actually the grandfather and i'm dying which is great fun i do all my scenes well not all my scenes a lot of my scenes in a wheelchair so i never got the opportunity to play somebody dying which is kind of fun um 
So yeah, so it's kind of fun being an actor, and I'm writing. I'm I actually wrote a play right now uh, about Joe McCarthy, and I'm working with uh, director Matt Penn, and I'm also working with Maya Wampusik on Zaguada. We're trying to get that off Broadway in New York now after the world premiere last year in North Carolina. So I'm I've been pretty busy with that. So uh, so currently that if we were are there any plays that you have uh, currently that are going to be uh, showcased very soon that people can go to? No, but can I tell people that my new novel is out? She's yeah. not there. Of course. It just came out this month. And um, it's uh, the title comes from the famous zombie song from the 65. You know, she's not there. And the novel's set in um, Saugerties, New York in 1965. It's a coming of age of a young kid. Um, 13 year old Christopher and he falls in love with the girl that lives on the other side of the cornfield. So it's um, it's a fun thing to deal with the 65 and um, I, I didn't realize it would resonate with so many people that I uh, that I gave it, to, you know, that that had read it already. Oh, okay. Where, where can they find it? On Amazon? Anywhere. It seems like it's all over Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, um, all these uh, novel websites, you know, book websites. Right, right. Okay. I'll be. I'm probably going to be doing a reading in the spring with the publisher. It, it was published by Bordera Press out of CUNY. Um, great small press. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Okay. Um. All right. Well, Rich, I mean, we're running out of time, unfortunately. Oh, wow. Yeah. We, we talk. It goes fast. I know. <laughs> um. But I definitely appreciate you coming on. It was great. Hopefully, we can see each other again. Yes. Uh, maybe with Lou. <laughs> No, but, no, yeah. Well, I'll invite you whatever I'm doing, and I'm doing something with Lou, you'll be coming. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, so if you people want to go check out your work, see what's going on with what's going on with you, where would where would they go? Um, my website, well, my website says nothing. <laughs> it just <laughs> it, it's just a way for people to reach me, richardpaterioauthor.com. But I'm all over Facebook, Instagram, uh, I still call it Twitter. I'm all over the place. So okay. you can easily find me and write me. And writing me is the best on my website, richardvateriaauthor.com. Awesome. Okay. Very good, Rich. Well, thank you very much once again for being on. I appreciate it. And I look forward to hopefully seeing you again and uh, checking out some of your work, which is, which is to tell everybody his work is amazing. Uh, not, thanks, Nick. You guys will not be disappointed. <laughs> Great. Good seeing you. I'll see you soon. You got it, buddy. Thank you very much. Thanks, man. Well, thanks, guys, for uh, tuning in to Mob Tales with Nick Christopher's. Uh, please like, share, and subscribe. And uh, we'll see you soon.